with anything for you from this, it's that we learn from this history. We learn uh, how this experience hopefully can now help us to be better people, can now help us to be able to understand each other better and understand where the other person is coming from. Because one of the things that I learned about all these people that I was involved with was that these were all good people. These were all very well-meaning people. These were all people who had their heart in the right place. These were all people who wanted equality. They wanted to have an even playing field out there where they could uh, have whatever anybody else was having and not have to struggle so much. And so I'm going to try to help you to see it from our lens at that time, the way that we saw it. So that's the timeline that I'm going to take you through. So in our next um, slide, you will see, and what am I supposed to have something to, you got me? Okay, so you will see that uh, in January of 1970, uh, La Raza Unida, La Raza Unida was a third political party that was formed in Texas that was founded by two people. It was founded by Jose Angel Gutierrez, who by the way, the way that I understand it is right now a professor at UTA uh, for Chicano studies. And Mario Compian, who for quite a while while we lived in San Antonio was actually my boss. I used to work for him in the uh, uh, Mexican American Institute. So uh, they were the founders of this. Now, I had met my husband in November of 1970, uh, almost a year after La Raza Unida was founded and he immediately was attracted to their cause. Now, if you will see that is my husband right there. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we did is that we had some marches and that was one of the marches, a march that we had in El Paso and he was a security person for the march. If you will notice, he's got a band around his arm that says the he says the septiembre, uh, security. Notice the mixture in the language. The he says the septiembre in Spanish, but security in English, because we were part of both cultures. And so we wanted to be made to feel like we were part of both, both cultures. As a matter of fact, I, if you'll go to the next slide, I have that with me today that same badge that he wore. Uh, we just kept it. We kept a few things, a few artifacts that I have with me today, if you wish to see them. Uh, so if you will uh, go to the next, let me, excuse me. Um, it's kind of hard to switch these. All right, so the Chicano movement, which is what we called it then, uh, the Chicano movement was, we didn't want to identify ourselves as Hispanic. We didn't want to be called Mexican Americans, but we weren't Mexicans. So the term that we used at that time was Chicanos. We were Chicanos. We were part of the Chicano movement. And it was mostly the people who identified as Chicanos that joined La Raza Unida Party. And Almost immediately when uh, Jose Angel and Mario founded La Razonia Party and started to, uh, to develop it here within Texas, other places joined in. We had uh, Corky Gonzalez, who joined from Denver. Uh, he was with a crusade for justice in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. And New Mexico, Reyes Lopez Tijerina, who used to find, fight for land grants. He felt like the government had come in and taken the land away from the people, the natives from New Mexico. And he, he became a very, very controversial figure. Uh, in California, Ruben Salazar. Ruben Salazar was actually, he was part of the Chicano movement, but he was also a journalist. And I believe that he was killed uh, in the line of work. Um, and Cesar Chavez, Cesar Chavez kind of was the, should we say that he was a pioneer of all of this? Because Cesar Chavez had, um, 
in the 60s had already started to notice that there was a disconnect between the rights of others and the rights of the people that he represented, which were the migrant workers. The migrant workers were people who would travel from one state to another following the crops. And the conditions under which they lived were horrible. They had them almost in huts and their families would go with them. So their children were not getting not only a stable home, but they were not getting a proper education. Uh, they were not fed well. The parents both had to work and many times they had to leave their children alone. And, uh, and since the parents were out in the field, they assumed that the kids would be okay at home. But it was uh, a very, very difficult situation that the migrant workers were in. And Cesar Chavez, seeing this being part of this in California, decided that he wanted to form a union. And this union uh, was called the United Far Farm Workers Union. And in this union, he would then represent the farm workers. So Cesar Chavez was actually the pioneer, I would say, since he started in the 60s. He was a pioneer of these uh, efforts now to bring equality and to bring justice for the Hispanic, for the Mexican-American, Chicano, whatever you want to call him. Uh, he, he was the one that started all of this. Now, if we'll go to the, the, the next one. Javier was very attracted to this movement because he had experienced racism himself. When Javier was in the army, uh, he had had an experience where he was in uniform and was going from uh, Fort Sam Houston to El Paso uh, to visit his family. And he stopped in Sonora to get a bite to eat. And uh, they would not serve him. They told him, we don't serve Mexicans here. And it was the first time that he had ever encountered on a personal basis, racism. And this hurt him a lot, but it even hurt him more when, uh, when he went to California with his best friend to uh, see some kind of, it was a, a football game of some teams. I don't even know what the teams were, but they went to California and they went into a bar and they sat at the bar and we're going to order a drink and they asked him to leave. And he didn't understand why, because this had never happened to him in El Paso. But he was told that he would have to leave and, and, and his friend would have to leave too. So they ended up leaving, were not able to get served because they were Mexican. Um, his father also had experienced racism, much the same as my father. Uh, his father, and my father both worked for the same company. They worked for Southern Union, uh, Southern Union Railroad. And it was strange when he shared with me that both my father and his father were very intelligent men. And whenever a position would come up, they were laborers, by the way. Whenever a position would come up where they would be able to apply, they were told the same thing. This is a job for a white man and you cannot apply. So they were passed off many, many times for positions because they were Mexican. So this is why Javier related so well to this. He says, hey, I know firsthand because I've lived it. I know what it is and I want to change this. So the entire family joined the movement. Right there you see his father, is sitting next to the front window. In the back is his sister-in-law, who, by the way, uh, was my best friend when we were in high school. She just less than a year ago had our high school inter I mean our intermediate school named after her. So it is now the Josie Villamil Tinajero Elementary School. And so you know, very, very successful, very, very, uh, very good people that were involved in all of this. The rest of the people inside the car are all family. And so it became a family thing uh, to be a part of this. His brother, that's my girlfriend's husband, uh, 
ran for state rep. Javier was his campaign manager, and this was under the Rasunida party. And so the reason that he's kind of decked out, the reason that he's dressed so well is because of the fact that he was a candidate for a state representative. And so he needed to dress up because he needed to make an impression. And so, um, so uh, you see the person on, on the side wearing his Mexican hat. So we had uh, all kinds of people involved in this, uh, not only the Chicanos, but the Mexicans and those who called themselves Mexican-Americans. It was a, a pretty big movement. Uh, there were many, many, many people who were involved. And so if we'll go to the next slide, I'm going to um, share with you about, let me see if I, here we go. Okay. The party also had support of the clergy. Uh, if you will see, uh, there were many, many priests who would join us, many, many priests. And that was one of the things that was very attractive to Javier. Javier being raised in a family that, was, that lived across the street to a church. He had been an altar server all his life. His father was a sacristan. His mother was, uh, would lead the choir. He related very, very well to anything that would involve the church. And his father uh, and, and uh, Father Richard Thomas, as well as many other priests would join us. What's really strange is that this was back in the early 70s. We were not married yet, our children were not born yet. And yet about 18 years later, Father Rick Thomas would give my number three daughter, Patricia, a full scholarship to go to Franciscan University, University because he, he knew about her family. A lot of it had to do with the fact that we were very involved at, at that time with the pro-life movement, but this would be 18 years later that Father Richard Thomas was already involved in our lives through La Razumida Party. Now, what you see here is the Black Eagle. Uh, Cesar Chavez chose the Black Eagle to signify the dark situation that the farm workers were living under. He used it when he formed the United Farm Workers Union. Remember I told you that he, that was one of his things to start a union. Uh, the Aztec Eagle is a historic symbol for the people of Mexico. The Chicanos also adopted the symbol. And uh, there was a time when uh, Cesar Chavez actually came to Dallas and he visited our home. He gave us the flags, the, uh, the farm workers flags, autographed them for us. I still have one of them, but there was a, a time when my uh, second daughter had a report that she needed to do for her class. I think she was in maybe the third or fourth grade, I don't remember. And she took a poster board with all of our memorabilia from the United Farm Workers, from the Cesar Chavez movement, including our flags. And overnight, someone took them. So we were left with uh, only one flag, which is put away. I couldn't get to it to bring it. And, um, but all of our uh, pins, our badges, everything was gone. But uh, again, going back to how they were very, very good people who were very connected to the church. We took him to Mass at St. Pius, and he was allowed by our priest to give a short talk because the whole reason that he was in Texas was to call attention to the plight of the migrant worker. So, uh, so he actually came here to Dallas. He spoke at our church, and he visited our home, and uh, was just... Uh, an amazing experience for us. Yes. In El Paso. He visited us. In no, oh, here in Dallas. Dallas oh, yes, okay. here in Dallas. We were already here in Dallas. Yeah, this was in the 80s, by the okay. way. Yes, yeah, so we had already moved to Dallas. So one of the things that La Raza Unida Party learned from Cesar Chavez was that marches were far more effective uh, for in calling attention to the plight of the Hispanic than getting involved in politics. 
Cesar Chavez was not big in getting involved with politics because he felt like that was a, a, a dead end street that, you know, they, they couldn't accomplish much. He felt like having these marches would, uh, would bring attention to what the migrant workers, and of course, in our case, the plight of the Hispanic uh, was, and people would hopefully join in the cause. This, this march was actually in El Paso. Now, uh, we kept a few things that were, I consider them to be artifacts of our time with La Razumida party. We used to get a, a newspaper that would come every month. This one is dated September of 1973. We got married in 1974, so we were still dating at this time. It was 15 cents, and, um, and it, uh, it again had articles about our heroes. And one of our heroes at that time was Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla. And so again, the connection to the church, that was always very, very important to us. Uh, then we had, uh, there was uh, a Congress in, in Chicago. They, they called it the Congreso de Aztlán. What was Aztlán to them was all these states that were bordering the United States that they felt really belonged to Mexico, but they had been stolen away from the Mexican country and they were going to do whatever they could to try to take Colorado, Los Angeles, uh, uh, Texas, Nuevo Mexico. They felt like all of these states rightfully belonged to Mexico and that whole area was called Aztlan. And so they, um, that was one of their goals, not only to seek equality, but to get this land back for, to its rightful owners. Now I, I say here, I still have some of the Razunida uh, artifacts. This is the, what you're seeing here is the Razunida Manifesto. It is uh, what, an explanation of what La Raza Unida is, why it was formed, what it was supposed to accomplish, what the goals were. And then in the very, very back, it had a list of the Texas party chairpersons at that time, many whom we met uh, because at one time they had the political convention in El Paso. And this was when they decided that they were going to start running candidates. Uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez had run some candidates already for school board in, um, in South Texas and, uh, and they had won. So they were getting a little bit confident that perhaps we could run some candidates in Texas and, and, and maybe win some elections. So uh, the other thing, this, this little South Texas town that I told you that uh, uh, Miguel, uh, oh gosh, what did, what did I tell? Uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez, excuse me, I forget these names. Uh, one of the things that he also started to do again under the influence of Cesar Chavez was that they had a Del Monte plant in Crystal City where they had run these candidates and they had won. So they decided that they were going to take up the costs for the people that work in these plants, very especially the Del Monte uh, plant. And so they also started to follow the example of Cesar Chavez to create these unions to help these people in different locations uh, and to, to, to support anybody who was facing injustices in all of these plants where they work, much the same way that Cesar Chavez had done with the migrant workers. So what did they do? They got really, really brave and they ran a candidate for governor, Rancy Muniz. We canvassed, at that time we were still in San Antonio, we canvassed every single house in every single neighborhood in San Antonio and others were doing it in El Paso, others were doing it in Houston. Others, we were trying to get 
a Hispanic or a Chicano to win the governor's race uh, in Texas. And he was running against Dolph Briscoe at that time. And so we worked very, very, very hard and he lost. Uh, the other one that ran was my old boss, uh, Mario Compian, and he also lost. What happened to Ramsey though, was, uh, was very, very, very sad. What happened to Ram Ramsey, and Ramsey was an attorney and a very successful attorney at that. Uh, we used to hang out with his wife and he had a little girl and, uh, and he was a very respectable, they picked him because he was a very respectable man. They picked him because he had uh, a very, very uh, respected law firm. He was a, a wonderful, wonderful man. And that is why they picked him to be the candidate to run for governor. Well, next thing you know, we hear that he had been arrested for carrying uh, 6,500 pounds of marijuana in his car. And he never knew where that came from. Uh, he was also arrested for possession of cocaine. And up until the time that he left prison, and I believe that he left prison, prison just very recently, he swore that he was innocent of all of these crimes, but he was a rising star with the Hispanic community. He was a rising star in the Chicano movement. He, he was a person that really, really threatened the powers that be at that time here in Texas, the other politicians. So we don't know for sure, but since I met Ramsey personally, since I knew his family, I could not imagine that Ramsey would ever get involved in something like that. But it happened, he was sent to prison. He stayed in prison until just not too long ago. Uh, and, um, and it was what it was. We could not do anything to help him, to defend him. So this was another of our little artifacts from the Chicano movement that was like, if you had one of these, you were in. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you had one of these, I mean, you made it. These were very hard to get a hold of, but, uh, but that was our symbol right there, Chicano movement. You know, that was, we're very, very proud of that. We're very proud of that, of that symbol. So uh, I talked to you earlier about the, the United Farm Workers flag, the one that was uh, taken from us. And, uh, and I put one up for you to see it. It was designed by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Again, we go back to the fact that Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta started out very, very well. It was not until they became influenced by many politicians that got involved with Ralph Nader and with Jerry Brown, uh, at that time, Jerry Brown was dating Linda Ronstadt, whom I also happened to meet. Uh, th they were caught up with people that did not have very good intentions. And they, whereas they were trying to do something under the umbrella of the Catholic Church, and they were doing it very very well, and that was what attracted many of us to them, they got sidetracked. And when they got sidetracked, then it started to uh, go in a way that many of us didn't want to go. It started to get very political, and it started to get very corrupt, and, uh, and many, many people dropped out after that. And uh, Cesar, as a matter of fact, participated in several, I think a couple of, since I remember a couple of fasts because he was very influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. He was influenced by Martin Luther King Jr., uh, even Malcolm X. However, uh, he would have these fasts, again, to try to do what he had originally set out to do to call attention to the plight of the migrant worker. But again, it was all lost when it became very politicized. And, and, uh, and he started to get involved with some of the people that did not have 
the same kind of thinking that he had and they were not they did not have ties to the church at all uh, they were just politicians so now this is where i want i was anxious to get now now you know a little bit of the history of my involvement with Rasunida, my involvement with uh, with the uh, Cesar Chavez group, but I want to tell you the rest of the story, all right? Because that's where it got really sticky for me and Javier. Because during this whole time, we were living in San Antonio, and we were very active in the church where we had gotten married, which was Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in, on El Paso Street in San Antonio. Our priest that married us was a, a Jesuit priest. He, he uh, died not too long ago. His name was Father Edmundo Rodriguez. And Father Edmundo um, called on Javier and I to see if we could uh, come to a meeting at the parish that was being held by the Industrial Areas Foundation. And it was, they were coming from Chicago. And they wanted to know if he wanted to know if we would if we would come out. So we did. And what they were doing is that they were forming an organization called COPS, Communities Organized for Public Service. We became very involved in pop in, in COPS. And they would uh, they had some very strange tactics for disrupting the status quo. I'll give, you an, uh, I'll give you an example. They would tell us, if you go to the bank to deposit money, deposit it in pennies, hold up the lines, make it hard on them. Whatever you do, make it, make it hard on them to operate. Give them a hard time. Don't just settle for their rules. Make your own rules and, and, and see them through. And so we thought that this was a good thing because we were finally, again, getting some attention uh, that we had never had before. And so we helped Father Edmundo form COPS. And then we didn't help with EPISO. EPISO was El Paso Interreligious Sponsoring Organization, but our good friend became the head of a piso. Her name was Elisa Rodriguez. She was Father Edmundo Rodriguez's sister. And so because we knew her, we felt ties, and we were originally from El Paso, we felt ties to a piso just like we did for cops. Now, they started to do these things all over the United States. These people from the Industrial Areas Foundation would come into the churches. They would talk to the priest, and they would tell the priest, would you like to get your streets fixed? Would you like to get uh, better lighting? Would you like to get more uh, drainage uh, in your streets? And he would say yes. And then he says, okay, we need to organize the people and we need to start making demands and we will not back down. We will insist that they give us what we want but we have, there's power in numbers. We have to have the power of the people. We have to have them cooperate so that we can do this. Well, we became very effective at this. You know, you had a, they, they kind of considered us to be the power couple because, you know, Javier was really, really well-spoken and he was, he was very good at this. And of course I wanted to fit in also. So we became very, very effective at doing what we did with the Industrial Areas Foundation. So then what happened? We got a call that someone by the name of Ernie Cortez wanted to meet with us. He came to our house and he offered Javier a job. He told Javier that he wanted for him to move his family to Chicago and that he wanted for him to become a full-time community organizer and that he was going to leave a contract with him that he wanted for him to read. I still have the contract that he wanted for him to read. And he also wanted for him to read a book. So uh, Javier told him, yes, that he would get back to him. And he and I, as we always did, started to research this 
uh, school, the school that he was wanting to send Javier to in order to become a full-time organizer was a Saul Alinsky school for uh, community organizing. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It doesn't sound familiar to you. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, so Javier and I started to read the book, Rules for Radicals. When we opened the book, the first thing that we noticed was that the book was dedicated to Lucifer, who was the first community organizer who rebelled against the system when he rebelled against God. And so this is the example that we were to follow. At that point, having a husband whose faith was the most important thing in his life and having a husband who had gone into this because it was within the church, we realized that we were getting into something that was very, very dangerous. Now, why do I tell you, why do I ask you if this sounds at all familiar? Well, the first black president that we had here in the United States was trained in that same school. He, he was a community organizer from that same school. And Hillary Clinton, as a matter of fact, did her uh, doctoral, or excuse me, her uh, master's thesis on Saul Alinsky, who had founded that school. Well, we started to look into it. We realized that it was not anything that we wanted to get involved with. We wanted change. We wanted equality. We wanted to transform people's lives. We wanted for everyone to have a better life, but this didn't seem quite right. So we turned him down. He kept coming back and telling Javier that he would be excellent for this, but we kept turning him down. It was at this point that my husband, who was a very prayerful man, uh, he was a man who had been raised in the church, loved the church, loved the gospel. He had the gift of tears. Whenever they read the gospel during mass, he would cry because he, he thought it was so beautiful he kind of resisted what they were trying to get him to do, but he didn't really grasp exactly why. He didn't grasp exactly why. But then eventually he talked to me and he said, you know, I've come to the conclusion that we are going in the wrong direction. We are straying from what we thought was this mission. When you start to use tactics that are not tactics that are based on love, tactics that are based on mercy, tactics that are based on faith, he said, I don't want any part of it. Up until now, that had all been part of the movement. We were all in with the priests and the churches until it came to that invitation from Ernie Cortez for him to join the community organizing uh, school. And then was when he realized that he could not continue. And later on, he was to tell me, you know, Aurora, I really feel like all these people who we got involved with, all these people uh, who had the same desires that we did, had the same dreams that we did, and the same goals that we did, left that focus that we had, that it had to be done with the church, that it had to be done with the gospel. So what he decided was, he said, from now on, we will no longer use these tactics. We will no longer use uh, this uh, movement. We will no longer be connected in any way with a political party. From now on, we will go by whatever the Catholic Church is telling us 
that we need to do. We will use the gospel as our, uh, as our anchor. That will be what we will follow. We will follow the gospel. And what we did is that we joined a community of people who were very, very charismatic and they were very, very, uh, um, they had a lot of teachings, a lot of retreats, a lot of ways that they could really influence the lives of people. We started, helped to start, we didn't start it, but we helped to start a Hispanic group within that. We stayed with them. And that was the first time that my husband actually said, I can actually palpably see that people are changing, people are happy, people are transforming their lives, people are leaving their vices, people are bettering their marriages, people are forming their kids. He says, I can see that the contribution that we are making through the church and through the gospel is so much more effective than what we were doing before. So at that point, we left politics completely and we became fully integrated into the church and decided that that would be our new, uh, our new focus, would be to work within the church to help people to transform their lives, to better their lives, to better their marriages, to form their kids through the gospel. Now, when Javier and I had gotten married, we had gotten married under some very, very difficult circumstances. And the circumstances were that I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you now into the part that says saving the most vulnerable of our society, which was always our goal is to work with the vulnerable. Well, it happened that through circumstances that were very, very difficult, I had become pregnant and it turned out that I was due to have a child just four months after Roe v. Wade became legal here in the United States before they passed that law. And so I had a child on January 4th of 1974, Roe v. Wade had become legal on January 22nd of 1973. So I, of course, having lost both my parents, finding myself homeless and in a very difficult situation, and not wanting to bother Javier with all of this because I had been away myself. I'm taking you back to 1974. I'd been away from the church for 14 years. I just married a guy that loved the church. And as a condition of being his girlfriend, I had to go back to church. So I was making a plan to abort my child. Thank God that Javier came to me at a time when it was, uh, it did not happen. I was, we were able to have our child and we were able to get married. But after seeing what we had been involved in, where we were seeing no change in the people, and now we were seeing that it was through the gospel that things were, were well, we decided who else are we going to help? How are we going to help? So we decided to get involved in the pro-life movement being that I felt such a connection to those girls. And so we started going to the abortion clinics at that time in Dallas, there were 13 of them. Right now we only have three and uh, two of them are almost never open because they can't find abortionists. But I decided to get involved uh, in the pro-life movement and he with me and we became just ardent defenders of the unborn, especially, especially when I found out that 600,000 Hispanic children were dying every single year from abortions. I realized that that was a very subtle way that they were eliminating our race. I consider it to be that very racist. I also found out that 52 of every, uh, of every 100 black children that were conceived were also being aborted. 
In our case, it was 27 out of every 100 that were conceived that were being aborted. So we became very, very fixated on the fact that something had to be done. This could not continue. This was the gravest injustice to the most vulnerable members of our society. And that's where we switched our focus. And we started to work with the unborn. It's been, what, um, 27 years now that I have been working uh, to help to save the lives of unborn children. My husband worked alongside of me on, in 2007. Uh, Bishop um, Grumman uh, awarded us the Pro-Life Persons of the Year Award for our work uh, saving the lives of the unborn children. And that has been my life now. And I was telling one of my daughters today, I at one time, had hoped that I would never have to revisit those days where we were involved in a movement, where we were involved in, a, in a, an organization, or actually it was a movement that could have destroyed our lives, that could have really taken us in a different direction. And I have known about the lives of many of those who did get sidetracked. Dolores Huerta is one of them. She's now pro-choice. Uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez, pro-choice. Uh, Mario Compian, pro-choice. So all of these people started out doing well, started out doing something good, started out wanting to help, started out with very, very good intentions. Their hearts were all in the right place. But when they strayed away, from the gospel when they strayed away from the church is when they got corrupt and they ceased to exist. That could have happened to us. And I told my daughter, I, I really had hoped that I would never have to relive these days, but just putting this together for you guys, I realized that maybe some good can come of it. Maybe some good can come that you guys will understand that we live in a time where you have you hear many, many voices. You are distracted in many, many ways. And everyone thinks they have the answer. Everyone thinks that they know the way to help their fellow men. But as in my last scripture quote here, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. And we were laboring in vain for a long, long time until we realized that we needed to come back to the house of the Lord and start doing things his way instead. So hope I didn't go over too long. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do y'all have any questions? Or did I really explain it well? <laughs> Are there questions and online questions that are um, I have so many. Yeah, few of them I've got I've got a formula a couple. Yes. Um, so going back to kind of like the beginning of your talk, um, was support for the Rossidia like mainly like only you know like in American people or, or was there support from kind of like the white community or was it pretty divided? It was pretty divided. We were we were considered to be a threat to the status quo. We were considered to be a threat to what had been very, very comfortably one-sided for a long, long time. The uh to us, the Republican Party was not such a, a threat because they, uh, we, none of us existed in their world, but we existed within the Democratic Party and we, we realized that we were being used. We were giving and giving and giving and giving, putting them in power, leaving them in power, but getting nothing back. And so, we realized that as a Hispanic people, we need to do something to change that. 
but we, we became a threat. Uh, and, uh, and they tried everything they could to stop us, everything that they could to stop us, which is why we had a hard time believing that uh, Ramsey was really guilty of what he was accused of. Uh, it really weighed on our hearts to see that happen to him. But um, that's what happened. Anything else? Yes. I have a question about particularly the, um, what it seems to me maybe a tension in, in, the, in the Chicano movement with, on the one hand, you said that the goal was to get equal rights you know, under law, um, but there was also the, the, the effort to effectively create a greater Mexico in the Southwest, um, which was to change the law in the whole country. And if so, what, uh, it's one thing to say, I wanna be an equal American. It's another to say, I want to make this place no longer the United States. Well, they didn't want that part of the United States for themselves. They felt like it had been one more injustice against the Mexican people who are our ancestors. There was one more injustice, yeah. and uh, and they took that on as part of their uh, of their goal is to have these states given back to the Mexican country. That they realized that we now live here, and this was not going to necessarily impact our lives. But they were trying to right a wrong that uh, that they felt affected the people that we had a connection to because they were from the country where most of our families came from. Yes. Um, how do you think that your work in like the civil rights movement kind of impacted your perspective on kind of pro-life work? And kind of like, what is your hope for the future of pro-life work kind of based on uh, what you've seen up until this point kind of what you've seen with other movements that are advocating for human rights? Well, what I see is there, there is a terrible, terrible lack of awareness. And I think that part of that has been the fact that our movement for, you know, our pro-life movement has been crippled very, very badly by the powers that control the uh, pro-choice community, uh, the media that has been overtaken completely by uh, left-leaning uh, people, uh, the, the fact that Planned Parenthood had the advantage that they marketed themselves so well from the very beginning, they marketed themselves so well. The only one that I think had a very, very clear suspicion that what was happening was not right was Pope Paul VI. And he got bombarded for his encyclical on, on human life because it was so popular to do what Planned Parenthood was doing and that was to offer women basically freedom from, uh, freedom from being mothers, freedom from being tied to the home, freedom from not being able to work, freedom from not being able to, uh, to prosper. And so they took that and they worked it very, very well to their advantage. And of course, everything that Pope Paul VI said would happen has happened. Uh, Planned Parenthood has succeeded not only in taking the lives of millions, I think to this day, there's a little bit over 62 million lives that have been taken by Planned Parenthood but they have succeeded also in corrupting the, the youth to think that sex is, is, is okay, it's normal, it's natural. And, and, uh, and, and, and they know very well that these are their future clients. They've succeeded in corrupting marriages because once they promoted the pill and now all of these uh, contraceptive methods, they also gave men the freedom to be able to have sex without consequence. And so now infidelity 
just rose incredibly. They, and subsequently also divorce. I understand that divorce is now out of every 100, there's 62 marriages that fall apart. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we have an organization, a giant called Planned Parenthood, that from the beginning, from the time that Margaret Sanger created that contraceptive pill in 1960 and decided that she was going to weed out, weed out the undesirable people, take them out of society and create a superior race of which those were, of course, the minorities that she wanted to weed out. That was her original plan. It was not to help the women to advance. It was not to help the women to have more rights or uh, as they call it now, reproductive rights or reproductive health. That was never her intent. Her intent, and it is still to this day, a very racist eugenistic intent is to eliminate the races that are not considered to be pure. And so we have to stop them. They might be a giant, but we have God on our side. That's why I feel that we have never gotten discouraged. We, we have never uh, decided to call it quits. We see the giant that is Planned Parenthood, but we know that we have the truth and we have God on our side. And we feel like eventually this is going to end. And I notice a lot traveling around because I've traveled to other countries to talk about this, that people are tired. They're tired of seeing this happen. And, uh, and so rather than get discouraged, I get very encouraged and I feel like I may not see it in my lifetime, but I think there will come a time where we will realize that what we are doing is wrong and it has to stop. We can't be killing each other like this because basically we are killing our future generations and, and it has to stop and we can't get discouraged. We can't give in to the lies and we can't give in to the threats from this giant that keeps wanting to bring us down. And yes, they have everything on their side, but they don't have God on their side. They don't have the truth on their side. And we do. And for that reason, we feel like ultimately we will win. So, yeah. Um, so just kind of like trying to tie in, I guess, both aspects of the talk and sometimes like what lessons do you take from people like people like Shabbos and whatnot that you would bring to like with the like image? Like what kind of virtues, kind of charisma, etc. Did you kind of like bring from that movement into your kind of your role as a collective? I think that what I would have liked to have seen happen with a lot of these old heroes of ours that we consider to be celebrities, that we consider to be the big names within the Chicano movement and within the, the farm worker migrant movement and uh, the, the unions. I think that if I would have had my way now, looking at it 50 years later, I wish that they would have realized that on their own and using the methods of man, using the ways of man would never get them anywhere and it would end up in destruction, which is exactly what happened. I wish that they would have stayed within the church I wish that they would have used prayer, that, that they would have used uh, uh, bringing people to the Eucharist. I wish that they would have used having retreats for people to teach them how to defend themselves in the right way. I wish that they would have used other methodologies that did not involve the methods that they adopted through the influence that they had from politicians and from outsiders who came in and basically, in my opinion, basically they came in and they destroyed the hard work of a lot of these people. Because that's what happened. In my opinion, that's what happened. These people are good people. 
They're not bad people, but they ended up very, very corrupt. And sometimes when you don't have a beacon, when you don't have something to guide you and to, to, to help you to, to, to stay focused, in our case, it was a gospel because like I told my daughters many times, we dodged a huge bullet when your father was told that he could become a very, very good community organizer by moving to Chicago and joining the Sololinsky School for Radicals. Had my husband not had the foundation that he had, that he saw that there was something awry with this, that there was something that was not right, perhaps I would not be standing here. Perhaps I wouldn't have the family that I have. Perhaps I wouldn't have friends like I have. Uh, my life would have been very, very different as, as his would have been very different. And my children's lives would have been very different. And the reason I say that is because I see the lives of those that left. I'll tell you who one of our friends, very close, very close friends was when we ran the movement. Have you ever heard of Rosy Castro? Have you ever heard of Julian Castro? Have you ever heard of Joaquin Castro? Okay, Julian and, and Joaquin are, Julian ran for president of the United States. Joaquin is his brother, who I believe is, a, is he a, a congressman? I believe he's a congressman. Rosie was our good friend. And this was before the twins were born. But I see now how Rosie being such a good woman and being such a good person at that time, when she went, when she strayed away, now the fruit of what could have been something good and something very sweet now has turned very bitter as far as I'm concerned, because when I see the politics of her children, both Julian and Joaquin, it very, it's very, very sad to me. It's very, very sad to me because they have become very socialist, very left-leaning uh, politicians. And, uh, and that is not what America needs. And it makes me sad because they're very intelligent young boys. Well, young men, uh, they're very intelligent and they're, they're very gifted. But that to me is what happens when you take God out of the equation. When you take God out of the equation, it is going to get corrupted. And it is corrupt. Anything else? Thank you again very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you guys. I hope you learned a little bit and you understand where we came from and why we are where we are now. Thank you, thank thank you, you for coming.